My name is Milano Passage, and I'd like to welcome you to Tumbo the Spectacular. It's a collection that has been going on in my home for about 60 years, and I have some of the uh, instrument builders' instruments that were really outstanding makers in the uh, 20th century. I'm standing in front of a little display here that we have of, for our Steve Barrich, who was a who was a very important person in our church activities. He taught over a hundred children in our church how to play tamburitsa. And Steve's life story is, reads like a Tolstoy uh, novel. During World War II, he was shot up a couple of times. He'll, they healed him up and sent him back as a first scout. And he survived all that, came home and began playing his beloved tamburitsa music. Incidentally, Steve was taught by Adam Popovich. And the two of them almost to the end played together. Steve was in his very large Chicago ensemble in Chicago. And uh, I recall Steve with our old Zoda Orchestra that we had years ago. And many of our jobs we played in Minnesota and those were really a joy. We would catch the train and when we got to Hibbing, Chisholm, or St. Paul, we were welcomed with open arms and we, we were always giving them a good show. And uh, just recently, I submitted Steve's name for the uh, Tamburitsa Hall of Fame, which will be held this month in California. And I knew they would accept him because his credentials were outstanding. So we have that to look forward to this, this month. Uh, Steve was a craftsman in many ways. There is a little display of his ability to make tamburitsa instruments out of aluminum. He, Steve was a tool and die maker in the mill, so that it was a they went hand in hand. And these are the outfits that we used to wear. We had two or three different changes. We were almost like Hollywood. <laughs> uh, Steve is pictured here with the old Zoda Orchestra. And uh, he did a lot for St. Salva Church. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Zoda Orchestra. Uh, I've played in two or three orchestras, but this Zoda Orchestra was the most outstanding. We got along wonderfully. We played some great jobs all over the country. And uh, there's a lot of folk tales that could come out of some of these stories. I recall one time we were coming back from playing a job for the Winter Carnival and the train ahead of us jumped the tracks. So that meant that our train couldn't go anywhere. So we were stranded there for two or three hours. So we pulled out our tumbleras and went all through the train playing for the folks and it went over real big. Uh, some of the other members in the orchestra were my uh, late brother-in-law, George Milovanovich. And we had, Goiko's not in the pictures, but Goiko Vojakovic was our first and best Bugatia player. And uh, Steve played the prima and I played the cello. And uh, we played many jobs. Last night as I was dozing off, I started jotting down some of these jobs that we played through the years. And uh, I've got a pretty good accounting of what I did but uh, I didn't have, the ones I thought of last night, I didn't have them cataloged and I didn't have the dates. So I'm just gonna enter them into this uh, little book that I've got, so at least I'll know where I did play. From this corner I'm standing up and admiring a lot of these pictures that I've collected through the years. I must have at least a thousand. We were uh, curtailed, we had I brought in 300, but we uh, there wasn't enough room to have all of them. But uh, this corner here, we featured the Popovich brothers, who are probably the most recorded tamburitsa orchestra ever. And they made eight albums and countless of singles. And uh, they served as a inspiration for many of us younger fellows that wanted to play tamburitsa. I remember when I played with the old group called the Continentals, I would make a few dollars playing a picnic 
And then that night, my wife and I, I was courting her at that time, we'd go to Club Cello in South Chicago where they had this tavern and uh, listen to their music all night. And uh, I would often sit there and ponder to myself, well, which one of these guys do I want to ape? Who, who do I want to be? I want to be a Teddy? Do I want to be Mikey? Do I want to be Adam? Well, I had my try at all three. But uh, one of the big moments for our old orchestra was uh, one night the Popoviches couldn't play and they hired us to take their place. And it was a wonderful experience, but it was very strange to see Mikey Popovich sitting in the back of the place and listening to us. And I just wondered, I wonder what he thinks we sound like. Anyway, uh, years later, after I, uh, my wife and I were married, we had my daughter, uh, they became very good friends. And toward the end of the period of their lives, they would visit me at least twice a month. And uh, we would uh, break bread, drink coffee with a little Schlievowitz in it, and tell a lot of stories. And boy, they had the stories. Uh, back in 1980, the uh, Tselenica brothers, who went to California, they were from Gary, but they went to California, and they got, they got involved with the uh, music industry and appeared in about 18 movies, did the soundtracks for many of them, and uh, one of the last things they did was the uh, soundtrack for the movie Dr. Zhivago. And uh, that year, 1988, I believe it was, they came to visit me, and we arranged to have a party at Adam's house. And I did manage to uh, do a VCR of that party, and it's hilarious. Uh, the boys played, Steve Tsarenisov joined him, I joined him, and we, we drank a lot of Slevo, told a lot of stories, and when they told these stories, they made me turn the camera off. They didn't want them on, <laughs> to be recorded, but it was a wonderful time. Anyway, standing in this corner, uh, there's Adam's vest that he played with, uh, had when he played through the years. And Adam was quite a craftsman, probably the most talented man that I ever knew in my lifetime. He had a great hand for, for writing, for drawing, and arranging music. He was a steel worker at South Lake, uh, South uh, Work Steel in South Chicago. And uh, as you can see, these two wonderful wrought iron tambouras uh, hanging on the wall behind me here. Uh, that was one of his hobbies. He did things like that. And uh, there was no end to his abilities. Uh, I would get a laugh out of uh, around the holidays. He would send uh, Christmas cards to us all. And right up here, just some, some samples of his, uh, his artistry with Christmas cards. And uh, he would, uh, he, he could just, uh, I remember one Halloween he came over with three small pumpkins and he made them on a little pedestal and he made these god awful looking faces on the, uh, on the pumpkins. And uh, he knew that October 31st was uh, my family's Slava and he thought they'd be appropriate for the, for the Slava. At any rate, uh, Adam was not the only talented one in the family. His brother Mikey, who was the first to leave the orchestra, he passed away unexpectedly and it was a big loss for everybody, the family and all the people that listened to the Popoviches. And anyway, Mike's hobby was he would make wooden miniature tamburitzas. And he made a whole slew of those. That took gold book there encased in that frame was from their 50th anniversary that was held in Chicago and there were people from all over our country that came to attend this affair and it was a huge success and uh, Gerald Ford was president at the time and he issued a proclamation and uh, each one of the brothers got a citation. I'm standing in front of the display that we had made up for the Tsarnenitsa brothers, who were originally from Gary, Indiana. They left about 1930, I believe. 
The only one that remained behind was Wasso, and he joined them a little bit later. They went to Hollywood and they got involved with the movie industry. And I believe in the movie The Merry Widow, the father was playing the bass while the three sons were playing Bulgaria, Brach, and uh, Prima. And uh, I believe I have at least 18 of their movies, and uh, some of them were outstanding. One of the greatest achievements that they did was the uh, for the movie Dr. Zhivago. And uh, it was just a lot of great songs that came out of that. And I'm sure everybody remembers Laura's theme. And when you hear the record, there's no mistaking that it's Tamburitsa being played by the Tsurlenitsa brothers. We have a picture here of years later when Steve's two daughters joined the group. They not only added good musicianship, but they added some beauty to the group. And Steve himself, Steve Tsurlenitsa, had an outstanding career of composing, writing music, and he did work for the Disney Studios. And here on the music stand are just a couple of the songs that he wrote for Disney. And one of the uh, most hysterical things that the Tsurlenitsa brothers ever did was they recorded a song called Tamburitsa Boogie, Ludi Boogie Woogie. And when you listen to the words, you just can't help but crack up. And uh, it went over big in a lot of American English groups picked up on the song and used it in their repertoire. This section of pictures that you're uh, gazing upon now is dedicated to the youth groups that we had in the area here for many, many years. And uh, St. Sava had at least 70 to 100 children participating and the late Steve Barrich was their teacher. And uh, the group traveled all over the country playing different places. And uh, we have youth groups from St. Elia, St. Sava, St. Michael's in South Chicago, and uh, we have one here with uh, a group from uh, the church, Saint St. I believe it's St. Stephen's on Redwood Drive, and uh, we're uh, particularly proud of that one because the young lady that was playing the, uh, the prima in the group uh, eventually would become a congresswoman in Chicago. And uh, I could see why she got to be a congresswoman. She was very talented. And uh, she was just one of the many students that we had. And many of these young folks made their mark in life. They are now middle-aged, but uh, doing a fine job for their church activities and, and endorsing Tamburitsa, of course. There is a record here that the uh, St. Sava Youth Tamburitsa Orchestra made. And their theme song was a song called Alai Gigi. And uh, the late Bud Pressner came in and recorded that song and they put it, put it out for sale and did pretty well with it. Uh, you know, I've often been accused of being a pack rat and I guess I am because I don't throw anything away, especially if it pertains to tamburitsa and music. So many of these things, uh, I'm going by the wayside for a lot of folks, but uh, they're cherished memories for myself. And uh, I can still hear these youngsters playing and still hearing Steve uh, hollering at them when they made a mistake. Pleasant memories, of course. Danica Cirich is very well known throughout the world. I recall when she was just a young gal singing Sevdalinka songs with my old Zora Orchestra, and the talent was there. And uh, she went through all the Serbian colonies in the country singing and, and doing her fine job of singing our songs. And while at Indiana University, she went into music, of course, and uh, studied it thoroughly. And years later, Diane, or Donitsa, would become the prima donna soprano for the Volks Opera in Vienna. And one of my fondest memories is we went to Europe in 74 and we stopped in Vienna and stayed with her. And uh, 
the first performance I caught her in, she had arranged for us to have these wonderful seats on, on a wall, like a, like a balcony. And this 100-piece orchestra cooks up, and it's, the music is blaring, and on coming onto the stage, skipping, singing, and waving to us in the, in the balcony is Donitsa. And I almost lost it. I just, I couldn't believe all this was happening. But uh, we caught her in three or four perf performances while we were in Vienna. And uh, of course, she was our tour guide too, took us to some wonderful places. And uh, on the wall here are pictured things from her college days, her high school days, her days at college, and then over here to my right here, are pictures of her in different opera roles that she played. And she was a, a delight, and everyone in Vienna seemed to like her. And uh, I'm sure glad we made that trip because it's a great memory for us. My wife and I always talk about it. And in the corner here is the original costume that Diane wore when she would sing these Serbian songs. And uh, she donated it, what, a few years back, I guess. And uh, there's so much more that I could say about Diane because uh, she is really a, a product of this church. And uh, Gary and, uh, has done real well in her career as a singer. She's retired now. And uh, she will be coming home this coming summer. And we're all looking forward to that. There's another portion here in front that uh, we called work in progress. I was anxious for folks to see how tamburitsas are made. So I have a few here in different stages so they could get at least an idea how, t how the bodies are shaped, the tops are made. And uh, there's pictures here of uh, students that uh, for the past five years I've been teaching uh, people from Inland Steel on how to build guitars. And uh, at first I wasn't going to take that job, but uh, it turned out to be a blessing. There's a uh, couple of primas started here. Here's a fellow here that, I don't know, somebody must have pulled him out by his neck, but he'll soon become a prima. It's a, what they call a gopher tortoise. Then there's some other primas here made in the in the uh, traditional way. And uh, the ones that are coming from overseas now are not made like this at all. They're, they're carved out of one piece, which is the easy way of doing it. Well, I must tell you about that bender there too. That's one of my pet stories. Uh, that circular brass thing that you see there used to be a pole in a fire station. And uh, I was working on this crew and they didn't want, I was the lieutenant on the crew, and they didn't want to slide the poles. They would come down the stairs with their hands flopping, taking their time. Anyway, I got so upset one day, I took a hacksaw and cut the pole down. And I got, a, got into a little trouble with that, but I had designs on it because it's made out of brass and it, I made it into a, a, a bender for bending the sides for these instruments. By the way, I, I neglected to tell you that uh, Inland Steel is no longer Inland Steel. It's called Mattel Steel now. And it's owned by an Indian man that owns steel mills throughout the world. And this program was designed by my uh, boss, Diana Lentz, and uh, it proved to be one of the more popular courses that they offered in this thing they called JobLink. JobLink was uh, established by her so uh, you could learn how to do electrical work, carpentry work, work on your car. They even had a course for couples to learn ballroom dancing. And when Diane approached me, uh, it was after I got the award in Washington, she came to the shop and gave me this pitch about job link. And I said to her, well, what do you want from me? She said, we have a lot of our workers would like to learn how to build guitars. 
And I was playing at the time, and I thought, well, I don't know if I should do this because I'm spreading myself a little too thin. And the more she talked, she convinced me to take it on. And it's, it's been wonderful because all these students turn out to be my friends, and the look on their face after they complete a guitar and hit the first notes on it, it's just, it's a wonderful sight, and it's worth every bit of it. I can recall when I started collecting Tamboritsa pictures, I was uh, pretty young at that time, and uh, I had a few pictures and uh, the late Marko Popovich enhanced my collection. He let me copy everything he had and he had quite a few pictures. And then through years I would capture my own pictures. Many times I'd carry the camera along with me and took the pictures myself. and. Uh, really pleased with the collection. Uh, our only problem was, like I mentioned before, uh, we probably needed three times this amount of room to show all these pictures. And the thing that I'm particularly proud of, we not in, only included the Serbian orchestras, we included the Croatian orchestras, and some of them I remember, remember from old Gary, and uh, they were inspirational too. And uh, I look at some of these pictures and like I'm looking at one here, six sisters and one brother from Nebraska and it was a wonderful outfit and uh, many of these pictures I have used with my stories that were written for Serb World Magazine and uh, it's been a real pleasure for me. The only problem I'm having now is I have many pictures but I don't have the information on the uh, fellows in the orchestras. So I'm handicapped there, but uh, many of the other ones, I, 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 made it a, I made it a life study. And I'm certainly glad I did that because we have a picture here I'm gazing at right now of six fellows from Gary that went to Indiana University and they were known as the Indiana University Tamboritsa Orchestra. Steve Barrich was in it, George Milovanovic, uh, Wayne Vidovich, uh, a fellow named Luka Sanovich, and uh, Anna Ranich. He was the uh, vocalist. And uh, looking again, I see Steve Markarevich, who was a Russian fellow that was an outstanding prima player. Steve Polich, who was versatile. He could play just about anything. And my late bass player, Jack Tomlin, and Steve Vucinich. And, uh, and uh, some of these pictures go back to the 1800s. Like we have the Hedgy family here from, they were on the border of the uh, Hungarian uh, Yugoslav border. There's pictures here of the uh, Cleveland Orchestra. I mean, we try to include the past and the present. And I think our people in the uh, organization did a fine job on it. What I have in my hand at this time is one of my prized possessions. It's a gusla that was made in Belgrade about 1914. And the uh, carvings are in Naive. And, uh, we have Kraljevic Marko, Tsar Lazar, Tsar Dusan, Milos Omilic. And you have what depicts a snake swallowing the hole. And this instrument sat on my piano for 30 years, maybe longer, and I knew very little about it. The only thing I knew was that when I went to buy out Ivan Lod, the tumbler maker from Chicago, as we were loading up my car, he handed me this and he says, here, this is gonna mean more to you than anybody else. Well, I liked it because it was a fine piece of work, but, uh, about a year and a half ago, I had a student come in from Chicago, a Serbian boy of Tsernogorsky heritage, and his father came with him, and he spotted this gusla on the piano. And he says, my goodness, he says, where did you get Perun's gusla? Well, I had heard of Perun. He was Petar Perunovic. He was the outstanding guslar who before uh, World War I really started. He went throughout America recruiting 
fellows of Serbian heritage to come back and fight for Serbia because they knew there was going to be a war. At any rate, I said, well, how can you be so sure that this belonged to him? He says, well, look. He said, there was a double-headed eagle here on the very top. And he says, and it's recorded in history that one of the bombardments that they had, uh, he was injured and the Gusla eagle was knocked off. Well, that's fine. But what I'm still trying to figure out is how did a tumbler maker in Chicago wind up with this body? But I shouldn't complain because I, I own this and I'm very proud of it. And I think it means more to me than just about all the other tumblers in this collection. There are many other guslas behind me here. And some of them I found out when I was in Europe are, are made by the convicts. And uh, they're, they're nice pieces of work, but they in no way resemble this. And on some of these shelves, you might notice there's all kind of piano music. And I inherited that from a lady named Violet Gurkovich, who married Steve Bolyanich. And on one of her many trips to uh, Serbia, she would pick up this piano music and uh, add it to her collection. And after the two of them were gone, one of the relatives made a present of the music to me, and I'm really thankful for that because it's, it's uh, wonderful music. Great for playing on the clavier, which is also known as the piano. Just in case you're not familiar with the Gusla and what it did for Serbs, during the 500 or so more years of occupation by the Ottoman Empire, the Serbs were not allowed to write any books, keep any accurate history of what was happening. So what did happen was these traveling bards that played this instrument called the Gusla would go from cello to cello and find out what activities happened. And that was their way of keeping track of all the battles that were fought. And it was uh, really a wonderful way because since they weren't allowed to keep up an accounting of everything, uh, we have a, 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 we can really be thankful that there is an accounting of our Serbian history. Our historical society, a few months back, purchased these lovely curio cabinets, and in them we have 35 tamboritsas made by some of the outstanding tamboritsa makers of the 20th century. People like Andrew Groschel, John Bancic, and Ivan Lod. In my book, these are the three finest builders we ever had. And uh, some of their work is displayed in these cases here. And uh, it's, I was just telling Dorothy a few minutes ago, I'm kind of sad to see this is gonna have to come down soon because it's a wonderful display that the Historic Society put up. And uh, there are instruments in here by some renowned figures, like I'm looking at Two primas now. One belonged to Janika Balash, who was the outstanding primash in, in Novi Sad. The other one is the first prima that Steve Barish ever owned. And I recall on a trip, I delivered it to uh, John in uh, Pennsylvania at the time, I think it was, or New York. He bought it and now his son-in-law owns it, Nick Seaver. A wonderful instrument, made out of a turtle shell, as is the one by Yannicka, too. There are other instruments in here. There's one made here by a man that did a lot of arranging for tamburitsas. His name was Rudolf Cernkovic, and he was a blessing in those days because people that learned how to read music could buy his music and books and learn the latest songs. There's a couple instruments in here. There's one on about the second cabinet there that was 
made by Ivan Laud, and it was displayed in the World's Fair of 1930 in Chicago. And what a year that was for Serbs. In Soldier Field, there were two large colo lines of about 75 people in each line, and on one end of the field, Adam Popovich's large uh, ensemble was playing. I think he had 40 or 50 musicians, and uh, they played the cola music for the group that danced in Soldier Field. That was back in 1930. We were very fortunate to obtain these sketches that Matt Rebrovich did. Matt is an uh, outstanding artist from Beaver, Pennsylvania. He's also a sculpture artist, and he did a, a wonderful sculpture of Nikola Tesla, who was one of my heroes, and the SNF bought it, and I believe they have it in one of their rooms at the uh, headquarters. At any rate, uh, Matt captured a lot of, a lot of outstanding Tamburica players in these sketches, and a strange thing happened here uh, the week before our Serb Fest. We had a gal come in here, a director from uh, Shoreline Television, and she was browsing through here and she says, oh my goodness, there's my father. Well, by her name, I would have never known who her father was. Her, uh, her name was Jody Jewell, and uh, her father's pictured here on an album and on one of these sketches, and his name was Tony Muslin. And I knew Tony well, he played with Duquesne, and when he moved out here, Chicago way, uh, I played many jobs with him. He was a wonderful musician. Uh, we have record albums here by different orchestras, and uh, got a Bugatti up here made by Jim Kovacevic, who was another outstanding Tamburica builder from uh, Ohio. And uh, a lot of record albums and a wonderful uh, fretted cello made by Ivan Lod. And not too many people know, but the cello as we know it today, the one that's held in the arms, that's not the way it originated. It, rewound, it originated as a stand-up cello and uh, it was played with a pick and it had frets where your concert orchestra cello doesn't have frets and it's played with a bow. But anyway, I acquired that through a friend of mine. He called me up one time and he says, uh, uh, I want you to come over. He, was, he had a uh, automobile parts store in Chicago. And I went there and he showed me four or five tamburitzas. And I said, well, what do you want done with these? He says, I don't want anything done. He says, I just want you to get them out of here. He says, uh, I die, so my wife is just going to throw them into a hopper. I want them to find a good home. And that's how I wound up with quite a few of these instruments. As a matter of fact, I got a call this past week from one of my uh, older friends that's still playing in an orchestra, and someone sent him a set of Farkash instruments. Those are the ones with the split frets, very small. They were very popular in the 1800s. And he, he asked me if I wanted them. I said, oh, I'll be glad to take them off your hands. This instrument here is, is called, by a ba called by the name a bass, but its actual name is a berda. And you will notice it has frets across the neck for finger positions. And it's for the strings, they're made out of piano wire, like in a uh, very large piano and it's played with a pick. And this one here is an outstanding piece of work done by Andrew Groschel. It's a carved top, carved back. And I was very fortunate in acquiring this. This came from one of the old orchestras that used to be in Old Gary, Indiana. Uh, the widow of this man, she called me up and asked me if I was interested, and I said, I certainly am. And that's how I got this bass. Next to the bass is a uh, thing that came from uh, traditional arts of Indiana, and it, uh, it did a little follow-up on my career as an instrument builder. And uh, these are the very same people that threw my name into the hopper for getting the uh, 
National Heritage Award. So we, they, they've been following me for the last four or five years, and it's been a real pleasure. And their director, John Kay, came down to our Serb Fest and had a most joyous time in this museum. And I thought he would be going back home the same day, but he didn't. He stayed around till the next morning and uh, photographed the uh, members of our church barbecuing lambs. We have received many fine compliments about the six instruments on the table here. We not only took care of the Tamburitsu instruments, but we included the Russian balalaika and the domra, which is the, the prima for the uh, balalaika orchestras. And balalaika instruments come in four or five different sizes. And even their bass is in a triangular form, and it's very much like our our Tamburitsa Berda. There is a Greek bazooki here, and there's a Greek baglama, which is an, so small people say, well, is that a toy? It's not a toy, it's an actual instrument, and it's used in a Greek orchestra. And if you listen to the soundtrack of, say, Zorba the Greek, you'll hear the bazooki playing, but you'll also hear this small instrument that doesn't uh, play melody or harmony, it just hits on single notes. The balalaika we have here in this corner is actually came from St. Petersburg, Russia. And of course, St. Petersburg later, uh, later on became Leningrad. But it's a very old collector's item. And uh, the domra here is a bold domra. And uh, that I got from a uh, company in Germany. And I made one. I made several of these. I made, uh, uh, for a priest up in Alaska, I made at least three or four for them. I made one for Roy Acuff's museum down in Nashville, and I made myself one. The Domra is actually the Russian's ver version of a Tamburitsa Prima. I have three instruments here that I'd like to show you, and I, they were made by luthiers or Tamburitsa builders who I considered the finest that ever came along the pike. Anyway, this first one is by a gentleman named John Vancich, who was from Cleveland, Ohio. And as you can see, with all the intricate inlays of mother of pearl and abalone, his work was excellent. For the back and sides, he used the finest East Indies rosewood, curly back, curly uh, maple neck. And, uh, He's one of my favorites. And the only thing sad is this is the only instrument I have of his. So it's a, it's a treasured item with me. The second one that I considered, considered a, uh, one of the finest builders was a Austrian fellow from Chicago. His name was Andrew Groschel, and he started the uh, K Guitar Company. And then after he retired from the guitar business, he started building tamburitzas in his attic, in his home. And um, I like his instruments because he doesn't go too overboard with the inlays, mother of pearl and abalone, but he does use great wood, Brazilian rose wood, maple neck, ebony fingerboard, and all of his instruments had wonderful sounds. And uh, I'm fortunate to have a braccio of his, a prima, a uh, tamburizzo cello, and a, a berda, which is also known as a bass. The third maker I knew very well. Uh, he, when he retired, I bought some of his equipment, and he, uh, he gave me a lot of things, including that one very historic gusla that we had shown before. But anyway, uh, this instrument was in the World's Fair of 1933. And again, it's loaded down with mother of pearl and abalone inlays. And uh, it's a one piece back, which is very rare, an instrument. Usually it's two pieces form the back. 
but somewhere he found a very large tree and and uh, managed to uh, get a nice back out of it. Now, the part that intrigued me for years was this machine head that is used on tumble hitches. For years, people had never knew, had never known where the where the instrument uh, machine heads came from. This is a thing that was originated in Germany because the Stauffer Guitar Company of 1800 manufactured their guitars with the tuning mechanism on one side. So, Tamburitsa people eventually adopted that. So most of the old Tamburitsas that you find, they all have the tuning mechanism on one side. And then, back in the 60s, I believe it was, Leon, Leo Fender, well known for making the Fender guitars, he uh, saw some Tamburitsa musicians playing someone, somewhere and he liked the idea of the, the pegs on the tuning pegs on one side, so that's how the Fender guitar got its tuning mechanism all on one side. So you see, this machine has traveled through a couple centuries. It's not a new thing, and it's still available. In fact, I just got an order from Germany uh, last week. And uh, Ivan Laud is considered as one of the greats and he was stationed right here in Chicago. This instrument here is something that I made. The shape is not original with me. This is a copy of something that Ivan Laud made. It was one of his best sellers. And I think this is a takeoff on the uh, Gibson mandolin, but he made it into a, into a brach form. And, uh, I made quite a few of these. They became very popular. Not, not so much with our people, but uh, uh, bluegrass people and folks that uh, use tamburitsa in uh, American ensembles. This instrument here is a mandel cello, and originally it was made by the Gibson. I had a Greek customer come in and. Uh, he uh, brought this instrument in and he says, can you make me an instrument with deeper sides but using the original back and original top? And I thought he was kind of way out of on, way out on that, but I said, I'll do whatever you want. So I made it for him and it turned out pretty well. And he let me keep the rim and the neck. And it hung in my shop for about 30 years and I decided I put it back in service, so I put a top and a back on it. So the mando cello is back in active. This is something that I uh, made in my off time. Uh, in the old country, the sheep herders used to play this. It was called a samitsa, and in some areas it was called a dangua. And it's not very great musically, but it, it uh, at least let them sing and hit the notes, you know. It's a very crude instrument, four strings all tuned alike, but I wanted to have one for historic purposes and that's why I made it. This prima here was made by a very outstanding prima player of the early 1900s. His name was Mirko Kolosar. He was Russian by uh, extraction, but he uh, got involved with tamburits and he played with some of the most famous tamburits groups ever to play on the American scene. This is a carved, carved out uh, piece of wood with a top on it, ebony fingerboard, and I sure would have liked to know who played this in the years past because I'm sure some fine musicians worked on this instrument. And this was a, uh, this was a uh, prima that I bought from Ivan Laud back in the 40, 46, I think, believe it was. Uh, I had just gone to work and didn't have enough money to buy a Prima, so my folks kicked in and my dad went with me to see Ivan Lott and uh, my dad was looking the instrument over and my dad was quite a craftsman in his own right. So he looked at these screws here and he says, well, why didn't you use countersink screws there? Well, Ivan was kind of a temperamental guy. So he did a fast turnabout, went in the back of his shop and he didn't come out for a half hour and he, I told my dad, I says, Dad, 
I'd love to have that instrument, but you can't say anything bad about it anymore. So uh, I got it, and at that time, I believe I paid about $250 for it, and it's made out of a cornucha, or a gopher tortoise. And I always thought that was unique, and uh, of course, this scroll work was fantastic. And uh, as it turned out, many years later, I would become the recipient of all the uh, tools that he had, like his drill press, his buffing machine. Yeah, this one is, uh, this one was my pride and joy. Uh, I made the instrument and did some of the chip carving on it, but my late friend Steve Polomchak did most of the chip carving and the uh, tinting of the coloring for this. And this is the uh, instrument that I used for the last 15 or 20 years of my playing. And it's got a fine, fine sound, and it's also a one-piece job with a Vulcan spruce top, ebony fingerboard, and uh, if this could talk, it could tell you a lot of stories. A lot of people get this instrument confused with a prima. Some people call it a prima. The only resemblance is that they play, they play the same part. But this, this is actually a Farkash Bisernitsa. And if you look real close, you can see the split frets, half frets. And this system was designed for children. And two strings represent the white keys on a piano and two represent the black keys. And uh, you have to give him credit. It was a, uh, quite an achievement. And uh, his full name was Milutin Farkash. Farkash, of course, is Hungarian. And Milutin is definitely Serbian. I acquired this instrument on a, on a trade. And I wanted it badly because the earliest primas came with these violin pegs as tuners. Those five and six on the line came much later. They, they started building those about 1900. This is an 1800 product here. And just look at this gorgeous curly maple. It's a one piece back and sides, neck, ebony fingerboard, and it's really a collector's item. I gave this instrument away years ago. It's the first one I ever made. And it's made out of a local turtle. Actually, the wrong kind of turtle to make a prima out of. But my brother and I went to Michigan City, and he was an expert marksman. He shot one in his swamp. We brought it home, and he insisted on having it for dinner. Well, all was well till I lifted the lid on the pot after three hours and I looked in there and I saw these legs still going back and forth. That took care of my meal. I couldn't handle it. But anyway, it was an, uh, an achievement for me because I made this when I was a tool and die maker with no knowledge of building. And uh, I'm tickled the way I did this head for a, for a greenhorn. It wasn't a bad job. There again is a Andrew Groschel Prima. Uh, he made fine instruments, but I think his brachas and cellos were much better than the, uh, the Primas that he made in the Bugadias. But I'm still honored to have one in, in my collection. And there again, it's Brazilian rosewood, ebony fingerboard, Vulcan spruce top. This Prima here uh, has a lot of meaning to me because after my mom passed away, I cut down the two black walnut trees that were in her backyard that she had planted 60 years before. And uh, I made at least eight of these. Most of them weren't this elaborate. You can see there's a lot of 
chip carving in here. And I've got the Serbian emblem here on the top. And uh, I think I used this Prima for uh, one of the recordings we made of Bud Pressner's music. Another fine instrument by a fellow from Ohio named Paul Pearman. Excellent wood. This looks more like koa than it does Brazilian rosewood. Of course, a nice curly maple neck, ebony fingerboard, and just enough inlay work to make it attractive. And uh, Paul Pearman was a uh, historic name in the Tambuisa. He taught. He, uh, I believe, he was uh, Jody Jules father's instructor. This one here has a lot of meaning to me because in 1976 I was invited to Washington to participate in the uh, Smithsonian Fair and it was titled Old Ways in the New World. Well they outfitted me with a tent with all kind of machinery and I brought some of my own tools and I made this prima on the grounds. And it was kind of a thrill because to my one side I had the Washington Monument, to the other side he had the Smithsonian Museum. And uh, after I completed this, they requested it to be entered in a contest that they had. And for three or four years it was uh, featured at the Renwick Gallery in Washington. And then they wanted to buy it and I said, no, I want that as a keepsake for my daughter. Uh, this was the uh, very first commercial instrument that I bought from uh, a group of brothers from Turtle Creek, Pennsylvania, Wallentich Brothers. It's an original instrument, and it's, but the top has been changed by uh, one of Ivan Lodge's sons because the, they had a little problem and they talked me into changing the top. I wish I hadn't now. This odd shaped Prima is uh, something that uh, the man that I talked about, uh, the Russian fellow, he made this. He made three or four of these. And uh, we had an outstanding Prima player called Steve Markarevich. And uh, he had one like this that was made by a gentleman. And uh, I liked it so well that I made myself one. It's made out of bird's eye maple, if you can see that wood, with a curly back leaf, a maple neck, ebony fingerboard, and uh, I used it for a few years, but like all Prima players, you think that if you get a different or better instrument, you can play better. In my case, it never helped. This Prima was made by the Tsarlenitsa family of California. Now the Tsarlenitsas originally were from Gary, Indiana. And when the oldest son died, they relocated to California, became active in the movie industry and made around 20 movies, many of which they appeared in person. But their greatest achievement was the soundtrack for the movie Dr. Zhivago. And this was a style prima that uh, Yovo Tsarlenitsa designed and they had a lot of success with it. And after Vassal Tsalenitsa passed away, they sent me the, the shell. It didn't have a top on it, so I put a top on it and added it to my collection. And I'm proud to have it. Here's another uh, collector's item. It's a Andrew Grossel cello. For years when I was playing cello, I used this on many of the recordings we made, and uh, I bought this instrument from the late Nick Svetich, who had Glimpark Bakery. Nick played as a young man, and we played in his tavern, the Casino Club, there on 38th and Broadway, or 37th, and uh, I always had my eye on this cello, and I, every night that I played there, I would badger him, Nick, when are you going to sell me that cello? So finally one night, he says, okay, you can have it. And I got it for an outstanding price. And I played it for years and it's got a magnificent 
sound. This one here I liked so well that I copied the inlay work off the Grosso cello, but I had Adam Popovich's cello in my shop one day and I took the measurements, copied it and made a form, and uh, I made a copy of the Grosso and this thing really booms. It's a great instrument and it's made out of Brazilian rosewood. Today, if you went to purchase the wood for the two pieces for the side, a back, two pieces for the side, it would cost you $2,000. This little mandolin was a trick mandolin used by the greatest mandolin virtuoso ever. His name was Dave Apollon. He migrated from Russia. He became a, a steady uh, uh, player at the Chicago theaters. I uh, caught him at the Oriental one time. I caught him at the Chicago. Uh, and this was his trick mandolin. And uh, I befriended a, a Russian woman that was a great mandolinist who was dear friends with Dave. And uh, I think she probably knew she was dying, so she got this mandolin to me. And she says, this is where it belongs. So that's how I wound up with, with this mandolin. This mandolin was made by a Chicago and his last name was Bowman. And the irony of this whole thing is Bowman's daughter married Andrew Groschel, the uh, Tumbuda builder and the uh, fellow that started the K Guitar Company. And uh, it's, it's quite a collector's item too. You know, folks bring me a lot of their cast off. They think it's junk, they'll bring it to me and maybe figure I could use it for parts. Well, I had a friend from Chicago named John Gornick who brought me this bowl. Now, this is hand carved, and this was made by Rudy Cernkovich, who is historic in Tambrica music. He, uh, he ended his career as a postmaster in Bradley, Michigan, but he, when he was in Chicago, he made tamburas and he did. Uh, arrangements for Tumbrizo orchestras and it's, it's an honor to have something that he did. Now it, this must have taken hours and hours to dig out with a, with a gouge and chisel. So when I got it I put a neck on it at the top and made a sea brats out of it. And I said, Rudy you're back in business. Now I showed you the Bisonitsa, the Farkas Bisonitsa, and this is the Farkas Brach. Again, you can see the half fretting, and of course, in those days the Brach was a very small item, so someone got the bright idea, let's make a bigger box with a bit better sound projection, and that's what happened. But it's, it's historic, and I'm glad to have it. There was a uh, violin maker and a mandolin maker in uh, Highland, Indiana. His name was Ralph Zanders. I got acquainted with him and uh, oh, I knew him for maybe about a year and then he passed away and then when his family went to dispose of the shop I've got many of the violins and violin cellos and, and uh, he had a fellow working for him that was in it. Of Turk and, Turkish origin, and uh, they were here on a green card, so he was without a job when uh, Xanders died. So I had him come to my shop, and he worked with me. And he taught me building of violins and mandolins. And uh, in some of the things that I bought from Xander's shop, this body was included. No top, but the body and the neck. So. I put it together, made a car top uh, for it, and uh, there again, it's a reminder of Mr. Zanders. And uh, we've had a lot of fine builders in this area. Uh, down the road off of 41, there's a place called Brunswick. I don't know if you're familiar with that little town, but 
it came into popularity because it had a very large building where they manufactured strings for the violins and mandolins and guitars. And uh, the fellow that owned it employed all his neighbors to work in that little factory. There again, this is a replica of Ivan Lodge's mandolin. I liked it so well that I decided, after, a, after he gave me all his equipment, I decided to make one just like it. And uh, this is kind of a takeoff on the Gibson F4 mandolin. It's a little different, but it's, it's kind of unique. And uh, I copied Lodge's head because that's what he had. And uh, it's an arch top, carved, carved top made out of bird's eye maple and um, it has its place in my home too. I would like to thank the president of the St. Sava Historic Society, Dorothy Bonovich and her husband Mike in filming this and I'd like to thank our whole board for letting me set this, this up. This was kind of a dream with me and uh, to have this all displayed in one room and the folks that did come through and, and viewed this they were very happy and thrilled especially the Popovich family because we had a great deal on the Popoviches and uh, I think this is could be considered my could be, could be considered my last hurrah because uh, this is displaying all the things that I've loved all my life and all these photos and everything and I'll forever be indebted to the St. Sava Historic Society and I thank you all.